first person I want to bring up here, though, is the person who is responsible for this gathering here tonight. It's an idea that she had last year to bring together all of the agencies and the vendors that work with storm preparation. And tonight is the second annual presentation of Are You Ready? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the emergency manager for the city of Biloxi, Michelle Crawley. Outreach of all of these organizations and vendors that are taking time out of their schedules to come and help us. Uh, the idea I had last year was to bring everything to you as a community and to make us more resilient. Because you know that that is the preparation is the key to our resiliency. And when we have to talk about these storms that are coming in, even the small one that we had at Hurricane Hur of Hurricane Nate last year. It caused so much severe damage in Biloxi that we are still in the process of rebuilding. In fact, I think our lighthouse pier is going to be finished out in a couple of months, right? So, so I just want to thank all of you as a community to come out and, and sit and talk with these folks and, and spend some time thinking about your preparations. We're going to tell you what you can expect to see in the hurricane season that begins on June 1st. And please welcome Matt Stratton, the EMA Deputy Director of Harrison County. Hello, Matt. It's great to see the crowd here tonight. And uh, I know that uh, you know, we have to be prepared for all types of hazards here in Harrison County. But hurricanes is our focus for this evening. And certainly with the season coming up soon, definitely want to be sure that everybody uh, has all the information that they need for that. So uh, as was mentioned, I'm Matt Stratton, Deputy Director for Emergency Management. Uh, my boss, Rupert Lacey, is out of town, so uh, he asked me to come speak with you this evening. But uh, definitely uh, just want to take a couple minutes to make sure everybody understands the dangers associated with these tropical cyclones. Uh, that includes hurricanes and tropical storms. And uh, that's because uh, they're, they really pose a huge threat to, uh, to our life and property here in this area of the country. Hazards from uh, strong winds to tornadoes, uh, rip currents, uh, strong waves, heavy rain, storm surge, these can all uh, work together to create uh, problems for us here uh, in Harrison County. And that's just the direct hazards, if you think about it. Uh, people can have medical emergencies as they're preparing or evacuating. Uh, there can be you know, chemicals and other hazmat uh, contaminants that are spilled during a uh, storm event. And so uh, these these dangers pose a real threat to us, to our lives, and to our property. You know, since uh, about the last 50 years, over 2,500 people have lost their lives in hurricanes and tropical storms. And so we need to be prepared uh, so that it doesn't happen to us. Uh, unfortunately, about half that number half of that 2,500 have been in Louisiana and Mississippi. So it's a real concern for us. Uh, you might have heard in the news that in uh, the last hurricane season, the 2017 hurricane season, it was the costliest ever. Over $370 billion in property was lost as a result of a series of hurricanes. That includes Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, Maria, and to a lesser degree, uh, Hurricane Nate here uh, in our area. Just went out. Yeah, I'm not sure what uh, what caused that, so I'm just going to talk loud and let me know if, uh, if you need me to speak up. So uh, we have a variety of experts that are going to be talking to you about preparedness this evening, and I know MDOT in particular is going to touch on the evacuation routes, but I want to make sure that everybody understands our hurricane zones, and I do have copies of this map on my table at the back here, and depending on where you live, you may or may not be in one of our hurricane evacuation zones for Harrison County. Uh, you need to make sure you understand where you live in relation to these zones so that if an evacuation order is issued by the authorities that uh, you know that it pertains to you and you do, do need to evacuate them. Um, so uh, definitely know your evacuation zone. I would also encourage you to have a plan before the season even starts. Talk with your family, make sure you understand what your plan is, where you're going to go, and what routes you're going to take uh, to get to your safe location. You also want to make sure that uh, you're monitoring the local media, and so that could be the news, it could be a, a variety of sources, but that local media is going to 
maintain your situational awareness so that you know the situation and if there is a storm that is forming or inbound to us. And then finally, you want to maintain your readiness. So uh, during hurricane season, of course, we all know we want to keep our car tanks, uh, fuel tanks topped off. You want to make sure that your uh, evacuation supplies and your uh, disaster kits are all ready to go at a moment's notice. And then uh, you also, of course, want to make sure that you're following the directions of the authorities. And so in times of emergency and disaster, the authorities are going to be providing information to you about the situation and how you can stay safe. So just make sure that you follow those directions and uh, that you reach out to us if you do have any questions or concerns. Now, uh, we've gotten a lot of questions about what the hurricane season holds for us. Nobody can say for sure, of course, but a lot of the uh, experts that are looking at the uh, long-range predictions for the 2018 hurricane season do expect it to be a slightly above average season as far as the activity is concerned. So uh, certainly not a time to rest and sit back, but you want to be prepared for that ahead of time. Uh, the experts uh, at Colorado State in particular are, are forecasting 14 named storms, that includes hurricanes and tropical storms. 14, uh, seven of those 14 are expected to be hurricanes this season, and three of those are expected to be major hurricanes. That means you category three, category four, or category five, the very strongest types of hurricanes. So it uh, looks like it's gonna be a above average season, and we need to be ready for that. Uh, you also wanna monitor uh, Besides the local media, our National Weather Service office, which is based out of the uh, New Orleans Slidell area, and uh, also the National Hurricane Center, all the great products that they put out. And uh, you want to make sure that you're familiar with how to access those sites of information and uh, how to find them. Please welcome First Lieutenant Garrett Black of the Hurricane Times. Um, Alright, so I'm Garrett Black. I'm a meteorologist, um, also known as Aerial Reconnaissance Weather Officer uh, for the Air Force Reserves um, at Keesler Air Force Base just down the road. Uh, we fly the WC-130Js, the four turbo engine props um, that allows us to penetrate into the eye of the hurricanes to collect data for the National Hurricane Center. Um, so typically in our missions we have five air crew members. We'll bring two pilots flying the aircraft, of course, our navigators, um, it kind of helps us with fuel plans and kind of the tracking and whatnot. Um, and then we have the weather officer in the back that's acting as the mission director. So we're chatting with the National Hurricane Center, kind of telling them what we're seeing, sending them the data that we're collecting. Um, but also, we're communicating with the crew to make sure we're kind of steering and going into the direction that we need to. Um, and then also we have the loadmaster. And they're doing a lot of the pre-flight stuff, making sure the aircraft's ready to go for us. Um, they're also releasing our drop zones, which I don't know how many people are familiar with it, uh, but it's a little weather instrument that we release from the bottom of our aircraft uh, that falls down to the surface, and it's constantly about three times every second uh, collecting and bringing data back to our aircraft. Where we can analyze it and make sure everything's okay before we send it to the hurricane center. Um, a few other things uh, that we use to collect data. The aircraft, of course, is collecting horizontal data that we're compiling. And then also we have a little uh, instrument under our wing that can read the uh, sea surface state of the water and tell us how strong the winds are at the surface. So we kind of package and bring all that data together uh, where we send it directly to the Hurricane Center and that kind of narrows that cone down to hopefully have to warn fewer people so we have fewer false alarms uh, and fewer evacuations. Uh, we typically go into the storms about 10,000 feet. Um, we'll kind of do an X pattern through the storm that gets us uh, all four different sides of the storm. And it also allows us to go through the eye two times, so then you can kind of uh, extrapolate to see how fast the storm's moving in what direction. Um, but the overall purpose of our mission is to, of course, improve the forecast data from the Hurricane Center. Um, so ultimately, that's why uh, you know we're excited to see all these booths around here because we go out and fly into the storms to collect the data to overall to make sure that you guys are safe. Uh, it's our number one objective. Um, and the booths around here kind of help compile and bring all that together. So it's really important uh, that everybody's taking in the information. Uh, 
I'm Robert Smith. I'm with the engineering department. We're over all city contracts, uh, rebuilding contracts, and more importantly, debris removal. We currently have a contract with Crowder Guff, uh, which is a contracting company. We have it set up where they can have trucks and people on the ground 24 to 48 hours within after a storm event when we call them. Uh, but we base whether we call them or not just on a, uh, us driving around and seeing how much debris it is. If city crews can handle it like a small storm like Nate last year, we don't call them. Uh, larger storms like Katrina or other large storms in the past, we have them on the ground as soon as possible. Uh, the most important thing residents can do to help the debris process is to separate your debris into the six categories there. Uh, the, the first thing that's going to come more than likely is vegetative debris and uh, construction debris. If uh, you can separate those on the curb first, we try to get those picked up within the first uh, week or two. Uh, then we have a, a second sweep where they try to get the remaining of the debris, which is uh, the large appliances, electronics, hazardous waste, and household garbage. If you keep all those separated, it will help your debris get picked up a lot faster. Uh, if it's all thrown in one pile, it may not get picked up right away or it may not get picked up at all, depending on how bad it is. So uh, if we do have a major event and you have to gut your house or do any debris removal, make sure to keep those categories in mind and also uh, get it as close to the curb as you can. Our debris contractor cannot go onto private property unless it's a special circumstance. So uh, it, you can't really flag them down and try to get them to come on uh, your property. That, that eats up their time. They're trying to get as much debris as fast as possible. So uh, if you remember those categories, they'll really help us out a lot. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to hear from Jason Smith of the Mississippi Department of Transportation, and Jason's going to tell you about evacuation routes. I'm Jason Smith from MDOT, and what I am here tonight with is our updated evacuation route guide. Uh, we'll pick them up back at our table there. There are quite a few, so help yourself if you got some for your neighbors. Be sure it is the one with the colorful image of the hurricane on the front. Because we have updated the hurricane evacuation routes for 2018, Highway 57 used to be one of our routes that we used for folks to exit the coast and evacuate and get up north. But there is, if you know, there's a bridge uh, on Red Creek about 20 miles up that is um, totally wiped out. We got hit by a truck pulling a thing with a backhoe and it tore it all to pieces. So we had to remove that right now if you go up there there's just a big old open space no bridge um, they were working on it this afternoon when i came up i got some pictures and um, there's a cement you know, slab that they're trying to create a work bridge but it won't be there until 2019 so you're going to have to find another route which is why we have these maps we also on the maps um, there's a guide that shows you where the hospitals are located where rest areas are located so as you are evacuating you can um, if you need some help, you have a medical emergency or something like that, you can find spots to get help um, and you find where you go quicker. Also, it includes a guide so that as you're traveling throughout the state, you can continue to get information and updates from local radio stations. You don't have to search around finding which radio station, depending on where you are on the map. We show you the coverage of the local radio stations that would give you the most current up-to-date information. On the back, there's contact info for a lot of state agencies here, but also state agencies in our adjacent states. So Louisiana, Alabama, Tennessee, even Florida, I think is in there as well. So that as you're leaving and you need some resources in Alabama, you can go on this guy to help you with that. Um, so it's good to keep in your car or handy wherever you in your evacuation kit with your important paperwork and things like that, just so you have it on hand. Um, and also in our packs that we've got over there, there's a safety tool that has a seatbelt ripper and it's got a, a little beaded um, glass breaker so that if you're stuck in your vehicle and you're trapped in floodwaters or whatever, it'll help you get out of there. So feel free to come by and grab one. 
for yourself, for each of your vehicles, for your neighbors, whoever you need one for, we are happy to give them to you. And then um, if you need more information or you need more copies after tonight, you can go on our website, which is goem.com slash hurricanes. Um, and you can order packets and we will mail them to you free of charge. From the Humane Society of the Mississippi Gulf Coast, we would please join me in welcoming Dawn Booth. is we cannot evacuate your animals and we cannot take your animals into our shelter because when the storm comes into the Gulf we concentrate on the 450 animals that are in our care and evacuate them out of the area. But what we can do is we can help you come up with a comprehensive plan to get your animals safe whether you evacuate to a shelter or whether you evacuate out of state. Like you, Pets get very anxious during storms, so it's critical that we put some things in place for them. One, every pet should have a microchip, and every pet should have a rabies shot. Even if your dog or cat is the friendliest of animals during storms, they could bite, and the fact that they have a rabies shot helps you and helps anyone that they've been. It's vital that every single animal that goes into either a shelter or goes on the CTA bus has a carrier. They won't allow them in on the CTA buses without <coughs> the um, carriers. We think that microchipping and rabies are so important that on May, the 20, on May the 19th, we will be having a microchip and rabies clinic down at the shelter. So there is a cost for that, but for the whole package of a rabies and a microchip is $25, and that will save you. That has the potential to save your animals' lives. There are also things like thunder shirts, making sure that your animals have their food, water, um, medicines. And if you need help with that, we can help you put that package together. Please welcome from the Salvation Army, Zach Rhodes. Good afternoon, everybody. How y'all doing today? Hey, I want to thank y'all for allowing us to come out and speak to you today. Uh, the Salvation Army, there's five main entities I want you to be aware of here on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Starting off in Pascagoula, it's our Red Shield Lodge. We do social services there. We have a homeless shelter as well. Coming back this way, in downtown Biloxi is the Salvation Army Cross. It's a beautiful community center. I advise you to go check it out sometime. All the way up in Loosedale, they have similar social service office up there as well. In Guffport at 2019 22nd Street, we also have a social service building there. And in Highway 49 is our family store. Now you may be thinking, why in the world is he telling me this? We're supposed to be talking about disasters. If a storm was to hit tomorrow, I want you to know where these locations are. Make your way to one of these locations, okay? They're going to be set up as what we would call a command center, a distribution center. We're going to have food. We're going to have water. We're going to have cleanup kits. We're going to have social service coordinators there to help you and to guide you to get back on your feet. And we're going to have pastors there as well to provide you with spiritual care, okay? So this is what the Salvation Army does. Again, remember those five different entities, Pascagoula, Loosedale, Downtown Biloxi, Guffport, and Guffport, okay? So there's various locations you can make it to. The Salvation Army's been on the Mississippi Gulf Coast since 1908, and we've been servicing uh, disasters here since 1969 when Camille came through. Same thing with Katrina. You know what to expect if a storm hits tomorrow. You're going to see us coming through your neighborhood in big, white canteens. We have various canteens that can serve you food, water, and different meals, okay? So keep your eyes out for these canteens. Off of these canteens will be volunteers working on these. Now these volunteers aren't going to be here from the Mississippi Gulf Coast if a hurricane hits here. These volunteers are coming in from different states all right, to help us out. So if you're interested in that service, please reach out to me. All right, I'd love to have you for that as well. Coast Transit is a vital service that they offer in the uh, wake of a storm, but it's a service that you need to know about right now, and it's a service that you can sign up for right now. Here to explain that service to you and the many offerings of Coast Transit Authority is the Executive Director. Please welcome Kevin Cock. Good evening. Great to see you all. 
We're the local public transportation agency. You heard a lot of information tonight about evacuation routes, help you can get shelter. Uh, we encourage you to watch local media. Stay on top of what's going on, current events. And when they call for an evacuation, make every effort to evacuate and listen to people. You know, a lot of low-lying areas, a lot of structures that are susceptible to high wind damage. So listen to local media. They're going to get information from the Emergency Management Agency, Harrison County Emergency Management Agency. We're there. We provide transportation support functions transportation. So if you're in an area that is called for an evacuation to get out and you can't get out on your own, that's what we're here for. You call us. We'll make arrangements. We'll come help you get out of harm's way. We don't want anybody to get hurt for lack of transportation. So if we can't come pick you up, we can take you to a shelter. Uh, we use shelters in Harrison County that are out of the flood zone, that are manned by Red Cross. There's support there. There's food. Uh, the emergency management people are there uh, to support you, to get you out of harm's way. We work with the Humane Society. If you have animals, many of us have pets. I have pets. I don't want to leave my pet. My kids are all grown and out, so that's, that's my pet. My, my children now, my pet. We, we know that. So we have a bus assigned and personnel we can help you move your pet to a designated pet shelter. You have to stay there and take care of your pet. So we're the last resort, not the first resource for you. We encourage you to get out of the area. If you can, any of you that have been here for bad hurricanes know what the, the condition the community is going to be in. You really don't want to be here after a hurricane like Katrina. You want to go visit with some family members for a week or two if you can. But again, if you're here, you're in harm's way, you can't get out, you call us at our office. Information's here. Here's a special hurricane evacuation brochure that will give you all the information. We also have a registration. It's going on now. You can call us ahead of time. You can register. You can go online and register. You can call in and register on the phone. It only takes a few minutes. We get your information, who you are, where you're at, what your phone number, what your contact information is. If you register for us, when the Harrison County Emergency Management Agency calls for an evacuation, if we don't hear from you, you'll get an automated message. It'll call out and say, an evacuation's been called, you're registered, call us to set up your trip. We've got a very short window of opportunity that when the emergency management agency issues an evacuation order for transportation to be available, we've got about three or four hours where we're trying to move everybody in Harrison County that needs transportation to a shelter. We have a lot of resources. We can do that. We've done this a lot. Uh, so, you know, unfortunately, we have a lot of experience. Uh, so we're there to help. You. That's the main thing. The information's here. You go to our website. And we're just a phone call away. So we encourage you to register now if you think you may need help, but you don't have to be registered for help. Our final speaker of the night is someone that I had the honor of working with for many years in a previous life. He is a great communicator. He keeps things simple. He speaks with relevance. Please welcome the Executive Director of the American Red Cross, Mr. John McFarland. He's also the oldest one here. That's why they made you laugh. <laughs> um, there's a lot to talk about, and, and what I'll do is encourage you to go by and get some of the flyers that I've got in the back of the room. But also remember that the, you can go on to your uh, uh, app store for your cell phone, and all of the information you need from the Red Cross is available in free mobile apps that you can download. They'll show you what shelters are open. They'll give you all kinds of information. What I want to talk about, a couple of things very quickly. One is that uh, Kevin used the word evacuate. The best advice, if you don't have to stay here for a hurricane, get out. And get out early. As soon as there's a, a hurricane watch, that's the time to go at least get north of the interstate where you're out of the major da uh, damage from, from rising tides. Further upstate you can go, the better. 
If you've got in-laws up there, make peace with them now. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, it might be a little trip and you're coming back in a couple of days, but keep, keep in mind that there's only two highways that can really get you out of here, and it's going to be you and 420,000 South Louisianans all trying to get out of the same interstate. And, and so people wait till the last minute, and that's where we have problems. I want to talk specifically about shelters. The American Red Cross is a nonprofit, tax exempt, charitable organization, but it's also the only one that operates under a congressional charter. We are a federal instrumentality. The Congress of the United States in 1900 designated the Red Cross as the disaster relief humanitarian agency. So, what we do, we're proud to do, but we're also required by law to do it. So, we're going to be here from before all the way through the end. Um, we're going to be here long after the cameras are gone. Hurricane Katrina, for example, hit in August of 2005. I was a volunteer then. We closed our last case in 2011, so we weren't here for just a couple of weeks. We're going to be here forever. Among the things you can expect from the Red Cross is there will be shelters open, and I'll, I'll speak briefly about that. You'll have food uh, in the shelters. There'll be uh, first aid, there'll be nurse, trained nurses. They're not Red Cross employees. They're professional nurses who donate their time to us. There'll be uh, mental health professionals because there's a lot of stress, and, and they'll be there for you. We'll have herbs, emergency response vehicles. They look like giant ambulances. They will be going through the neighborhood for weeks at a time, for weeks after the storm, providing hot meals. So if you have a home to go back to, You'll see the Salvation Army or us. One of us will be there feeding you three times a day. They'll also have nurses and health professionals on board. We'll also have trucks going through neighborhoods providing emergency supplies, tarps for your roof, uh, uh, bleach, cleanup kits, comfort kits, bottled water, hand tools, things like that to help you if you're, if you're home, and casework. We'll also be providing at the uh, you know, emergency financial assistance to people. But remember, we are not your insurance company. That's your responsibility. So, you know, we, we put people up in a hotel if that's what they need. We'll provide them money for emergency medicine or baby supplies or whatever. But when they come to us because I lost my 76-inch uh, screen TV or I've lost, that's, that's not our. On shelters, this is what I want to emphasize. There are two kinds of shelters. And, and let me back up even more and say, we don't own the shelters. The shelters are the county's responsibility. So when storms come, the county emergency managers will designate which shelters are open. They won't all be open. That's why I won't tell you now which shelter to go to. It will depend on the storm. Uh, one of the things you don't want to do is put people in a, in a shelter that, on a, that is on a road that tends to flood because you don't want them to get trapped in there, depending upon which direction the wind is coming. What the anticipated intensity of the storm will determine which shelters will open. So as Kevin and others have mentioned, once there's a hurricane watch, pay attention to the media. It breaks my heart to having worked 42 years for a newspaper to tell you to watch television and listen to the radio, but they'll keep you up to date on which shelters are open. When they're open, they become our responsibility. Now, there are two kinds of shelters. One is what we call an evacuation shelter. That's the shelter that's open to get you out of the storm so that you can live through it. You're only going to be there a short period of time. There aren't going to be cots out. So bring along a pillow or, or a blanket or something to sit on. There'll be chairs, but we don't put cots out for a reason. There will be refreshments. There'll be water, uh, juice, uh, soda, coffee, fruit, snacks, you know, energy bars, granola bars, things like that. No hot meals. The reason we don't put cots out is the ADA, the American for Disability Act, requires 10 square feet per cot. And in an evacuation shelter, a lot of people are coming in there to get out of the storm. And if we put cots out, there'd be no room for people. There are cots in the building waiting. And if somebody absolutely needs one, we'll put one out. We don't like to do it because if we put it out for one, then everybody wants one. So if you're for the evacuation shelter, it's a good idea to bring along a blanket or something to sit on, bring a pillow or whatever. You're only going to be there until the storm passes through. That's an evacuation shelter. Once the storm passes through, those shelters become residential shelters for people who don't have a place to go back to. And they will stay open as long as needed.
they will have cots. There will be three meals a day. There will also be caseworkers in there. There will be the doctor, the uh, nurses, and the, uh, the mental health professionals. And and I said the caseworkers that work with you one case at a time to see what other assistance is needed. So I just want to remind you of that. Uh, we, we had a good exercise last year at Hurricane Nate. It was the first real storm that we've had since Katrina. And a lot of people were upset because it was their first one and they got to, the closest one here was the Arborville High School. And they got inside and they had to sit on the floor for about four hours. And they wanted, shit, they wanted the cots. And, and I mentioned that's the reason we didn't do it. If we would have put the cots out, there wouldn't have been enough room for all the people that were there because a lot of people obviously showed up. But once it transitions from that emergency shelter into the residential shelter, then you, you've got everything you need. Let me stop there and, and uh, uh, see if there's any questions. John. Yes, sir. A shelter is not a place you want to go. <coughs> no, and that's why I say get out. Uh, uh, I'll tell you this. Along the coast, there are 14 shelters that will likely open in the event of a, a hurricane. Now, there are more, but, but there, there, there are 14 that normally open right away. All together, we could probably house about 7,000 people. There are 420,000 of us now. So that's why I say, if you don't have to stay here, go. You can always come back. Um, no, and, and especially if you have to stay in a shelter for, for a while. Again, after Katrina, I, I worked as a shelter worker. And uh, you know, I was staffing a shelter Thanksgiving weekend. That's a long time for people to have to be in a, in a, in a room you know, about the size of this, sitting on a cot 10 feet away from somebody else and, and, and eating box lunches and, and, and not spaghetti at night. It's not, it's not a hotel. It's not the best place to be. You will be taken care of. It's better than being out in the street. And I, I don't want to downplay it. I mean, we do our best to make it as comfortable as possible. But if you can, leave. If you need us, we will be there. Um, any other questions? Download that mobile app, it's free. Uh, or those mobile apps. Be sure you've got insurance. Please, if you're a renter, renters tend not to have insurance. It is very inexpensive. Like I said, we can find you another apartment, or, one, or we can help you find another apartment when it opens up. We can give you some emergency assistance, but we can't replace everything you lost. So be sure you have insurance. Uh, if you have special needs, as Kevin mentioned, we do have special needs shelters. There will be a shelter designated as a pet shelter. Um, and, and as I said, we do the best we can. The last thing I'm going to tell you is this, if you're new here. Living near the Gulf of Mexico, there is always a threat of hurricane. Hurricanes are an amazing force of nature. They need to be respected, but don't be afraid of them. You live in an area that you could not live in a better area if you have to be near hurricanes because you've got the most experienced first responders. Your police, your fire, your county people, your emergency manager, CTA, the rest, the rest of the team, MEMA, Mississippi Emergency Management, FEMA, and the Red Cross, which is a part of that team. We've been doing this for a long time. And a lot of us are up in years have been doing it for a long time. We communicate regularly. The city holds these things to get you prepared. So we, we know what we're doing. It's never perfect. They call them disasters for a reason. But it's, but, but we, it, it, it's not a first time thing for us. So if you just listen to instructions, prepare now. If you can leave, leave. And, and then leave, just, just follow the instructions. You'll be okay. You don't have to be afraid of them. Respect them. But, and one of the things I wanted to make sure you get, if you haven't picked up the sheet, you can also go to the website, is there's one of the sheets says, returning from a hurricane or flood. More people get hurt after the storm than during the storm because they don't, you know, your guard is down. The storm is over, I'm going home, and I've either got a mess to clean up to help add to that 100-story pile of debris, or I'm lucky, my house is still there. But you don't think about the fact that that high wind and those tides bring in critters to your yard that aren't usually there. And that's when we see a lot of snake bites or a lot of spider bites because people are out in flip-flops and shorts trying to plant the debris.